I really appreciate what Janie said last session, that the whole purpose of everything is to know God. So that flows nicely into what we're going to look at finally this afternoon, and that is intimacy through the Word. Now, we hear a lot about intimacy. I looked up some things. In Psychology Today, Asahel Ramanelli wrote in 2019, intimacy can be defined as the ability to meet yourself when you're near someone else. It didn't make sense to me, but <laughs> I kept reading. Some therapists distinguish between two types of intimacy, other validated and self-validated. Other validated involves your partner validating what you share with them. And if they are not open, receptive, and sensitive to your vulnerability, then you consider them not a safe space. Whereas self-validated is basically where we choose to share something that is important to us even if our partner is not open, receptive, and validating. <laughs> that happens with my husband a lot. <laughs> Hopefully our partner will listen and understand. <laughs> Sometimes they don't. Another PhD, John Amandio, said, we're wired with a longing for safe and satisfying connections. When we're intimate, we feel connected, and when we're not connected, we feel distant and overly cautious. Yes. A nourishing intimacy happens, I think I lost, when barriers melt and hearts open while not neglecting the need for healthy boundaries. No matter what source one researches from the world's experts in order to grasp this concept of um, intimacy, the starting point always seems to be self. And their machinations on the subject are contradictory and often self-defeating because intimacy, divined again by the venerable Noah Webster, is a close familiarity or friendship nearness in fellowship, and inherent in this definition is union with another soul that involves giving and receiving. Sadly, the Christian sources that I sourced today don't differ too much from the world. In an article posted by Biola University entitled, Deepening the Spiritual Intimacy of Your Marriage, intimacy was defined as the process of opening our heart of profoundly connecting the core of your being to each other without giving up yourself. In another article, The 13 Proven Benefits of Intimacy with the Holy Spirit, the title alone providing you sufficient evidence of which direction that's going, the author begins with, we long to have intimacy with the Holy Spirit, but if we're honest, only a few of us enjoy a close relationship to Him, it's not that those who enjoy intimacy with the Spirit of God are special people, but they're ordinary people who go the extra mile to get close to Him. Our relationship, he continues, starts with the Holy Spirit at salvation, but we can only become intimate with Him when we surrender to His leading. And they went on to explain that becoming intimate with God through the Holy Spirit involves the Holy Spirit will drive you if you allow Him to, but He will never possess you. And the benefits reaped from such a state of intimacy were, as you might imagine, never feeling alone, feeling peace, having courage, and living a life of purpose, and so on. Still very me-focused. So it would appear the church has been infiltrated with the world's view that all things begin and end with me. I need to see what I'm going to get before I can commit. And perhaps all human relational int intimacy does begin this way because we're depraved. We are natural narcissists. And we can only give to a point, whatever our point might be, before we begin to expect a return on our investment. It is our natural propensity to all things self that makes the intimacy of God displayed to us in the scriptures so incredulous and unattainable. 
how do we get into this place? Psalms 42. As the heart pants after water brooks, so panteth my soul after you, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? How do we get to the level of intimacy of David when he wandered in the wilderness and penned, O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory because thy loving kindness is better than life. Such grandiloquence is really outside our daily experience. So that the graphic impact of such terminology is easily lost to us in repetition without appreciative understanding. Then something does happen in our lives. A loss, a grief, a crisis, a financial worry. And we grope for something of substance to hold on to and to gain comfort and support. And these vivid experiences of longing and intimacy that really did take place between a human soul and God when they are divorced from their context and turned into memes and plucked randomly from cyberspace... Can we really lean on them heavily? Is that really intimacy? Can we find in them security and hope and peace? And then, when they're not as satisfying as we feel they should have been, we find fault with God and His Word. And all throughout the church today, the Bible is no longer enough for people who call themselves the children of God. They need helps and books and study guides. And we're not <laughs> demeaning those. They need music and counselors and therapists and science. But was the problem in the word? If it is sufficient, why doesn't it satiate that soul thirst satisfaction that we're looking for? Where is God, you say? I don't feel him. I read the Bible and I don't get anything. They're just words to me. Can we really find intimacy with God in his word? Well, Hosea 2.20 says, I will betroth you unto me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Intimacy, it appears, doesn't begin with self. Intimacy begins with God. God doing something to me, for me, and in me. To understand what a life of intimacy with God through his word might look like, I want us to read from Exodus chapter 19. We're going to try to take some lessons in intimacy from the life of Moses. For time, I'm not going to be able to read chapter 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. So I'll pull sections from that. Remember in Exodus chapter 18, Jethro had come down and had given Moses some advice about delegating responsibility so he could be freed up to memorialize the laws and statutes of God, to teach them to the people. And at this point, the children of Israel had been about three months out of the land of Egypt, so not very long in their um, journey. And uh, Moses had already spoken with God. He had already gotten some preliminary words, which he had already given to the elders of Israel, and they had already agreed to follow them. So then we come to this point in chapter 19, and God had told Moses to fence the mountain off and set the people apart, that he was going to come down on the mountain and meet with Moses and Aaron. Going down to verse uh, 20 of chapter 19, and the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up on the Mount Sinai, for thou charged us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down. And thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the people and the priest break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and spake unto them. He gave them a second warning. Don't come on the mountain. In the next several chapters, 20, 21, 22, and 23, the Lord expounds to Moses and presumably Aaron different laws concerning civil and moral matters. In chapter 24, we have a truly astounding passage. Because as McLaurin um, recounts, next to the incarnation, this is the most wonderful and far-reaching moment in history. It is the birthday of a nation. It is the foundation stone of all subsequent revelation. Revelation whose issues oppress ancient people even today, and its promises are not yet exhausted. In this chapter, Moses performs the rites of covenant He took blood and sprinkled it on the altars of the burnt sacrifices and on the elders and the priest. Then the people and their representatives, the elders and the priest, entered into a solemn covenant with Jehovah God on his terms, entirely committing themselves to his sovereignty and his lordship. And then as a token of this, of his favor, the Lord favored them with his visible presence. And you see that in verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand, They saw God and did eat and drink. Having been made accepted by the blood of sacrifice, those people whom the Lord chose for himself over all of the tribes of the earth saw God and fellowshiped with him. But astounding as this scene is, the next is even more incredulous. The Lord turned from the 70 elders and the priest, upon whom he had not laid his hands, and he turned to Moses and issued this very regal command and gracious invitation. He says, come up to me in the mount and be there. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God, and a cloud covered the mount. Verse 16 And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Verse 18, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud. And Moses was in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. What took place in that shadow we know must be included in the many books Moses wrote. Certainly, a primary purpose of this time in the cloud was the institution of the tabernacle, the methods of study, the sacrifices and feasts, all outlined in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The instruction was intense, it was personal, and it was everything the Lord's people needed to institute a nation of righteous living. And it wasn't committed to finite memory. In chapter 31, verse 18, we are told that God gave two tables of testimony written in stone with the finger of God, which Moses took down the mountain. The testimony of a covenant into which they had entered so recently with their God in stone. 
by the finger of God. But God knows our hearts. And he knew that down the mountain, the people so recently, so recently, in covenant with him, were not with him. And he sent Moses down the mountain to confront the people who had become so quickly unfaithful. In chapter 32, verse 15 and 16, and Moses went down the mountain, it says, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Verse 19. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp, and he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. When Moses saw the abominations of the people, he flung those precious words to the ground and splintered them. The people had broken the newly minted covenant, and they were unworthy of the revelation of Jehovah. But God knew they still needed his word, and he is a God of forgiveness. So after he was implored of Moses for a stay of execution and after Moses cleaned up the mess and buried the dead and pitched the tabernacle outside of the camp so that the Lord would descend upon his people again, in chapter 33, verse 9, and it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And the Lord spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And we were given ear to this intimate dialogue, this great and powerful leader acknowledging to the Lord God his dependence and his desire. So often, those who know us best know our weaknesses and failures. And sometimes it garners from them distaste and disrespect, but not from the Lord. Moses' voice was all longing and his arguments were all entreaties. If I have found grace in your sight, verse 13, show me your ways that I may know thee. Remember, he had just spent 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain with God in a cloud. And he still feels like he doesn't know God. This longing was not interpreted by God as a sign of weakness. It didn't elicit from the Lord disgust and contempt. Instead, it elicited comfort and assurance. And he says to him, in verse 14, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Good, says Moses, good. Because if you don't go with me, I'm not going. So the Lord offers him another reassurance. I will. I will go with you. So that should comfort Moses, and he should be satisfied, but he's not. He asks for more. What does he say? He says, 16, 17, I will do this thing that thou hast spoken. He says, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he says in verse 18, Moses, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. 19, and he said, I will make my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious unto whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. But he says in verse 20, thou cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. But the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass when my glory passes by, I will put thee in the cleft of the rock and cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. But my face thou shalt not see. Verse 
God said, I will show you me. You can't see all of me. Can't bear, you can't bear it. But everything that you can handle, I'm going to give it to you. In chapter 34, God told Moses, Hew two more tables of stone, like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. This time in chapter 34, Moses doesn't go up the mountain with Aaron, and he doesn't go up to the mountain with Joshua. This time he's all alone. He rose early in the morning and took his two stones and ascended the mountain. And the Bible says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood by him. Moses stood on a rock in a cliff, and the hand of God covered him. And he beheld all the glory of God he could humanly bear, hearing the voice of God, giving him direct self-revelation of who he was. He says, And the Lord passed by and proclaimed, The Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and the fourth generation. This is who I am. This is who I am, straight from my mouth to your ears. The creator, the eternal, unknowable being, stooping to explain himself to a man. Tenderly, carefully, gently. And then he walks him through the laws and the covenants and the testimonies all over again and writes them all over again on tablets of stone. Another 40 days and another 40 nights with no food and no water, nothing but the engulfing, satiating, holy presence of an unbearable being in an intense face-to-face -face communique. No man could walk this experience and ever be the same again. And Moses wasn't. His face shone so brightly when he came down the mountain that he had to cover it with a veil. When he talked to God, he took the veil off, but when he talked to people, he had to cover his face. Now, you would think this is the climax of Moses' life work, right? This is where the scenes fade and the credits begin to roll. But that's not the case at all. The fact is that this is very early on in the journey to the promised land. The children of Israel still have to build the tabernacle. They have to send spies into Canaan. They have to rebel over and over again. That results in 40 years of wondering. Even Moses himself in his disobedience defaults on the promise and is barred from entering the promised land. He still had long, weary work to do to train and teach and judge and corral a stubborn and rebellious people. Any of my mamas say amen. Day in and day out, moment by moment, manna and quail, bickerings and fightings, tasks and duties, wonderings and plottings. This is not the beautific ideal of intimacy that one would expect. And certainly not the intense intimacy of those 40 days and 40 nights. But the Pentateuch chronicles the many teachings and exhortations of Moses to this people. His prophecies from the mouth of God that he gave to them to prepare them. A generation that would rise up and conquer the world. His testimony of that intimate experience with his God inspired generation after generation to look with anticipation and expectation for a Messiah. And when that Messiah would come, generations later, hundreds of years later, that intimate experience that fed that inspiration through the ages was given to chosen few who recognized that Messiah and followed him. 
while his earthly plottings were completed, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses received his heavenly summons. His place of burial is not known. Like Enoch, he walked with God and was not. But he was memorialized as no prophet ever. The one whom the Lord knew face to face. And there are other stories of intimacy all through the scriptures. I wish I could tell them all to you. Abraham, who was called the friend of God. Mary, who was chosen to be the mother of the incarnate God. Isaiah, who saw the Lord high and lifted up. David, a man after God's own heart. Noah, who among all the inhabitants of the world found grace in the eyes of God. Job, a man marked righteous by God himself. All the disciples whom the Lord called my friend. But all of these individuals are marred and flawed, and many of them have grave sins documented in their biographies. Their days were just like ours, full of mundane and dull, interspersed with conflict and dramatic chaos. But each one of them found intimacy with the Lord God through his word, in his self-revelation, in which he communed with them personally and revealed aspects to them of his character and being which changed their lives and the lives around them. And in each of these counters, words were central. Spoken words, written words. In this little bag, y'all can't read this, is a sampling of letters. A series of communications that my husband and I engaged in in the two and a half years of our long distance relationship. We had text and email, of course, but he's an old fashioned romantic and he believed in letters. So letters and cards became a regular habit. It always surprised and delighted me when I would go down to my work email or box inbox and I would find a thick envelope in very familiar scrawling penmanship. Sometimes I would tuck the letter away, wait till I could find a place just to read it. Sometimes I would tear it open right there just to see what was in it. Those letters were a vital method of learning the man that I would one day marry. Sometimes he would text me, and he would say, give me your thoughts on such and such a topic. And initially I was like, I'm not putting anything in writing. (laughs) I don't know what somebody will do with that. I worked in the legal world. You don't write things down. You don't want used against you as evidence. But he would write his thoughts to me, and he would trust me with his ideas. And all he wanted was a response. He wooed me very subtly in this manner for about a year or so. And unbeknownst to me, I was being drawn into an intimate communion until a year or so in, I realized suddenly reading one of his very long epistles that I had shared far more with this person than I had ever shared with anyone else. And it was so terrifying to me. And amidst all the other conflict that was going on in my life at that time, I decided the best thing to do would come to Birmingham, cut it off, erase data, dump, you know, get the control out, delete. When I came down and I saw him face to face, I remember that day, all those words stored up in my heart, his words, his thoughts, his mind and heart given to me as a gift. I found the cords were wrapped too tightly and our souls had become entwined like vines in the night. And there was no going back. Things spoken can be misjudged, misperceived, or misremembered. But things written can be reread, resavored. They can be digested slowly. They can provide a launch pad into deeper subjects. 
The written word facilitates better understanding. They can be memorialized so that even as the memory fades, it can be revived and refreshed. And when the trials set in and Satan sows seeds of discord, these words can be revisited and first love found again. In the encounter with Moses, the Lord didn't merely speak to him face to face, as astounding as that is. But the God who sees, who knew what lay ahead for Moses, and he knew that there would be 40 years of deep trials and waters of conflict and difficulties, and he knew that while the Lord was ever with Moses, that Moses might not always be with the Lord. So God wrote, those words. And so important were those words that when Moses made them unreadable, God wrote them again. And those words have sustained even to this day and many, many more where God drove men to paper to memorialize his self-revelation and ensure that his love knows him and knows him deeper and deeper as much as they can bear, so that when the summons comes to us, come up. There will be no argument and no delay, just joy and excitement to be with the one whom our soul knows and loves. Intimacy is not a switch that's flipped on and off. Intimacy is a process, even plotting at times. You may say, I read my Bible and I don't get out of it what I could consider deep moments of intimacy. Well, perhaps your expectation of what intimacy is should be reconsidered. Is intimacy with God a feeling? Is it some profound inspiration that we might have? Is it some new and novel idea? Is it an experience that turns us into a spiritual giant impervious to failure and frequent falling into sin? Well, if we look at the life of Moses, we would know after two 40-day and 40-night experiences on a mountaintop, we know certainly Moses had a feeling his face shone, but not forever. Certainly he had profound inspiration, but it wasn't his inspiration at all. It was God's. And certainly he was a spiritual giant, but not that spiritual. But Moses can teach us about what real intimacy is. What is authentic intimacy? The first thing that I believe Moses teaches us that the first hallmark of an authentic intimacy with God is that it must begin with vulnerable humility. Like a child. Many have stated that intimacy means not being ashamed. But we are ashamed, aren't we, if we know ourselves? We have much that would bring a blush to our cheeks. We're all lawmakers, uh, lawbreakers and guilty before God. He said so in his word, that mirror into our souls. But he has covered our shame with his righteousness. And all he requires is simple humility and affirmation and agreement with his judgment of us. And we can, because our sin does not affect our standing in his love or his acceptance. We're loved because he chose to love us. We're accepted because he made us acceptable. And while our cheeks might blush to remember our sin and our head hang when we fail and falter, like that adulterous woman, he will lift us up and he will say, I don't condemn you. Go, sinna no more. And he sent us a love letter that tells us over and over and over again. This authentic intimacy is reciprocal as he unfolds his love to us and beautifies our shame with his righteousness. We can't help ourselves, we want to know more. And he obliges, he loves us to know him. 
Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me. I will answer you. And I will show thee great and mighty things that you know not. All who seek will find. Jeremiah 29, 12, call me. Come talk to me. I will listen. God speaks to us and he desires us to speak to him. God reveals himself and invites us to know more. But we cannot if self is in the way. It has to be about him. This reciprocal nature of intimacy leads to the second hallmark I believe Moses shows us about authentic intimacy, and that is exclusive knowledge. On the mount, and even in times previous to this experience, Moses was given words that he had shared with the Jewish people, exclusive from all the nations. Yet in this 40-day experience, the second time, Moses received knowledge of the Lord that no other Israelite was given. He had a face-to-face experience in which God revealed who he was directly to Moses. Why? Because Moses asked. Unless we think this is an archaic event, unconnected from the New Testament church, Jesus himself in John 15, 15 said to his disciples and to us, henceforth, he said, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his master does, but I have called you friends. Why? For all things, all things. I have heard of my father. I have made known to you. I haven't held anything back. Barnes wrote, he opened to them his mind, made note his plans, acquainted them with the designs of his coming, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. But like with Moses, he did it slowly, gently, as they were able to bear. We sit under the preaching of the word of God Sunday after Sunday with all the other people of God, but sometimes there is a sermon that we feel like we have experienced more intensely than others around us, or we feel the pricking of the Holy Spirit more keenly than others appear to have, and we walk away and we say, that message, that was just for me. This is my old Bible. My husband felt sorry for it and replaced it as a wedding gift with this big Bible. But I had this from childhood. And throughout the pages are marked dates at certain text or scribbled notes in the margin or a name. Sometimes I just open this Bible like an old friend. Just remember. Or sometimes things I've forgotten when I see that date, I'll remember it. This is my memorial that even though I don't feel intimate with the Lord, there have been moments when the Lord reached down and said something to my heart. I encourage y'all to do that. Get you a Bible where you just remember something that the Lord said. Remembrances of events and joys and calamities, trials, uncertainties. Moments when I needed something that no human could supply. And there was the Lord speaking his peace, speaking his intentions, speaking his certainties, speaking his love. Even now I pick up my Bible and flip through it just to remember that in this season of busy, when I feel so disconnected from all things spiritual at times, And that even though I'm not with the Lord, he's still with me. Alec Moitner wrote, The distinguishing mark of the people of God is their possession of the word of God. It is the hallmark of the Lord God stamped on Adam in the garden. When grace found Noah, it was in the word of God. Abraham lived by the words of God. Moses revealed the word, multiplied it, itemized it, and made it all-embracing. 
What is that word? That word is I am that I am, and more I am. This unfathomable being, this unfathomable love that we are invited to dive into, to sound and to know. John said, I have written, I have written, I have written, so you'll know. And the more we know of God, the wider is our gratitude and the stronger our fidelity, our confidence and our trust. When we prove the character of God revealed in our lives, it strengthens our resolve to lean more heartily and more heavily and trust more fully and more boldly in the person who has given himself to us. Fidelity and confidence in God is a third hallmark of the soul intimate with God. When the fallen world strikes a devastating blow or shaking uncertainty or a terrifying fear, what do we do? Do we run to the shelter of the beloved? Do we find comfort in his embrace and respite in the shadow of his wing? Can we say with Habakkuk, though the fig tree not blossom, neither fruit be on the vines, though the olive fails and the field yields no meat, Though the flocks be cut off and there's no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Why? Because the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk in mine high places. How did Habakkuk know this? How did Habakkuk, who had delivered such devastating prophecies, declare with such strong conviction because he knew God. He had his word. This intimate knowledge is the bedrock of our faith. From an old hymnal, why should I ever anxious be since such a God is mine? He watches over me night and day and tells me, mine is thine. Such intimate knowledge, which shapes higher reaches of faith, will lead to an intense desire for presence. The more I knew the heart of the man who wooed me, the more I longed to be with him. Though we are in seasons in this time in our life of harvest and toil, our hearts still long for moments of just usness. And isn't that the experience of Moses with the Lord? Chapter 30, 33, Moses showed his longing for the presence of God in verse 15. If your presence not go with me, carry us, not up hence. And this has been the heart cry of every saint of every age. Be with me, Lord. Be with me, Lord. It is the heart cry of every Christian parent. Be with my children, Lord. It's the heart cry of every minister, pastor, missionary, and teacher. Be with the flock, Lord. This desire for the presence of God is a sure sign of the authentic intimacy with God. Our seasons can be full and distracted, but that heart will fill that pull to be with our beloved. We grow so weary, so weary. We long for refreshment, and sometimes we can get so weary we don't even know what we need. But God knows that we need his presence, and like a good husband, he provides us opportunities to meet with him. Notice in chapter 19 of Exodus, God told Moses to tell the people a second time they were not to come up on the mountain. And Moses argued with him. I've already told them, they're not coming. They know, we've blocked it off. And one day God said, go tell them. Because God knows the heart of man. No doubt in all that crowd, there were people who had ideas. And if they ventured up on that mountain, then Moses' time with the Lord would have been interrupted. He would have had to go down and deal with the melee and the death and the disobedience. So God sent him back again to circumvent any 
distractions from the time that Moses was to be with the Lord. Alex Motnier wrote, when the Lord appoints means of enjoying his presence, he expects us to make use of them. To neglect these means signifies that it is a matter of indifference to us whether the Lord is with us or not. The Lord did not expect Moses to neglect his duties and be always in the tabernacle. For 40 years, Moses trod the dusty road and did the dirty work. But whenever God called him up on the mountain, Moses freed himself from distractions and went to be with his God. If we're not feeling intimate with the Lord, could it possibly be that we are so distracted and so unwilling to free ourselves from those distractions in order to lose ourselves in the presence of the Lord by his appointed means? I'm not preaching to you, dear sisters. Always a reason, isn't there? Always a child to take care of. That's important work. A phone call, a friend. Are we not getting inspired? Inspired intimacy during our times in the Word because we're just listening to the Lord with half an ear. Like Moses, we need to exercise the disciplined patience of sitting in the cloud until the Lord comes to us. So many means he gives us. Every Sunday, we open the house of worship. Other opportunities. Finally, the fifth hallmark of an authentic intimacy with God is a growing, burgeoning expectation for union. In the weeks leading up to my wedding day, amongst all the details and the issues and the cataclysmic life changes, my betrothed would send me notes and texts reminding me that he had arranged a quiet getaway and that soon, soon, there would be quiet and rest. I didn't look forward to the dress or the ceremony or the flowers or the reception. I could have passed all of those off. But I kept my eyes on the cabin, far away from people and problems, when just the two of us could sit down and talk face to face. No cell phones, no kids, just us. Talk about all the things that we had learned about each other and the many letters and epistles that were sent back and forth. And to this day, no matter what else is going on, he's still my quiet place. And in Revelation 21 and 22, our divine beloved whispers to us of his desire to be with us. In Revelation 21 and verse 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, it's with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, our beloved, said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write! For these words are true and faithful. Write! Send them my love letter. Write down what I will do for them so that they will know Tell them that I long to be with them. Tell them how much I want for them. From the Old Testament 
to the New Testament, Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither have they seen with the eye, O God, besides thee, what you have prepared for him that waiteth for you. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 9 and 10 is a repeat of that Old Testament sentiment. Just said all over again, almost verbatim. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear hath heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Our heavenly betrothed says, I have things for you. And I can't wait to give them to you. And I want you to know about them. And I'm writing them down so that you will know my heart. And you will know my mind. As life is more revealed for the fallenness that it is, and God is revealed for the steadfast perfection that he is. And as we draw nearer and nearer to him in these temporal experiences, is it not that we look so forward to that day? That inevitable union where there will be no distraction, no impairment of body or mind, no impurity of thought or motive, now through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Is this your hope and your expectation, my dear sisters? If it is, then you have an intimate relationship with God Almighty. And if this is not your growing desire, halting and feeble, but it's there, do you know him? Because as the old song says, to know him is to love him. And to love him is to long to be with him. How do I know him? Oh, <laughs> he wrote you letters. Letters with his very hand. Letters with his very breath. He's told you his mind. He shared his heart. John Owen speaking on the tutorship of the Holy Spirit and understanding the scriptures says, this is the principal means of all holy intercourse with God, the scriptures. How does the world, which is destitute of this fruit of divine bounty, grope in the dark and wonder after vain imaginations, whilst it knows not how to manage its convictions, not at all to deal with God about its concerns? But Ephesians 4.20 says, you have not so known Christ. Matthew 11.29, take my yoke upon you and learn me. I'm gentle and humble and you will find rest for your souls. Are you away from God? Have the wilderness wanderings dampened your spirit and dimmed your expectations? Come, he said, let's reason together. The revelations of God in the scriptures are like those quiet pools Lewis wrote about in the wood between the worlds, a place of quiet and stillness where you forgot all else that was going on in the world behind you, where evil lost its power over you. And by dipping into the one of the still pools, you plunged into another world full of mystery and insight and revelation. May we often visit the wood between the worlds and plunge ourselves into pools of revelation where evil has no pull on us and come back refreshed, knowing deeper truths, loving with a deeper intensity, satiated, with a soul thirst satisfaction. Let's pray.
Father, we confess how often we neglect these letters of love that you have sent us. How many times it hasn't mattered what you had to say. How often we quench the Holy Spirit. How big and looming is the world and how small and diminished is you. But Lord, we thank you that though we are not always with you, you are always with us. Draw our hearts after you, O Lord. Cause us to feel our thirst, that we might seek the water of life found in these pages. And Lord, for each of these ladies here, for each of them, if they don't know you, as you are revealed in these pages, would you open their hearts? But, oh, Father, if they do know you and their feet are dusty and their hearts are dragging, draw them to you, Lord. Help them to commit anew to knowing you better in your word. Thank you for these words, Lord. Thank you that they are true and faithful and that they are enduring and that we can hold on to them until we see the word face to face. We honor you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.